first speaker is Chris and um, <coughs> Lamida from our institute. He can speak on very um, popular and um, hot topic contains mathematics and the sex theory. So please, Chris. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to speak in the seminar. Uh, so yeah, so I was asked to, to give a talk here about condensed mathematics, uh, which I am doing despite the fact that I don't actually know very much about it uh, myself. So uh, my specialty is really in set theory. Uh, and recently, a few years ago, I did some work in set theory, um, motivated by questions in homological algebra that ended up having some relevance for uh, foundational questions in condensed mathematics. And so started to learn about it since then. So everything I say today will be at a very basic level uh, on the condensed math side, because that's where my understanding is, and on the set theory side, because I'm not assuming any uh, background knowledge from the audience. OK, so uh, let's get started. The first part of this talk is going to be an introduction to the very basics of condensed mathematics. Uh, so what is the idea behind condensed mathematics? What is What problems is it trying to solve? Uh, so from what I understand, the, the basic motivation for it is that often we want to apply algebraic tools to study uh, algebraic structures that also carry topological structures. And the problem is that the sort of classical categories of algebraic objects with topological structures are very badly behaved from an algebraic point of view. Uh, and so just let me give a couple of, of examples. One is a, a very basic example, maybe uh, overly simplistic, but I think uh, is, a, is a very good motivating example. And it's the following. Uh, so let's say we're in the category of uh, topological abelian groups. Uh, topological abelian groups. Uh, consider the following map. Uh, it's going to be a map from uh, the real numbers with the discrete topology to the real numbers with the usual uh, Euclidean metric topology. Uh, and it's just the identity map. Okay, so this is a continuous homomorphism. It's a morphism in this category. Uh, it's obviously not an isomorphism, right? Because these are definitely not isomorphic objects in this category. Uh, but if we're working sort of algebraically, we would want the fact that this is not an isomorphism to be witnessed by something in the category, right? Either a non-trivial kernel or a non-trivial co-kernel of this map. Uh, but in the category of topological abelian groups, we have neither, right? Uh, it makes sense to talk about the kernel of this map. The kernel of this map is just the trivial object. Uh, but in this category, it doesn't really make sense to, to talk about a non-trivial kernel of this map. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a defect that will be, be rectified in uh, the category of condensed abelian groups. Um, to give another slightly more abstract, maybe more, more advanced example of how things go wrong, uh, let's suppose we have a topological group. Uh, all of our groups still be abelian, let's say. Uh, so we have a topological abelian group G. Uh, consider the uh, category of G modules. So these are topological abelian groups with a G action on the, on the group. Uh, now there's a, a nice notion of cohomology in this category, uh, continuous cohomology of, of Tate. Um, but in this category, uh, short exact sequences are not taken to long exact sequences of cohomology groups. Right? So it could be the case that uh, short Exact sequences 
may not give rise uh, to long exact sequences. of chronology groups. And there are some sort of simple examples of this. Uh, so let's say that G is the circle group, R mod C, uh, and consider it's the short exact sequence. Uh, where the G action is trivial on all of these uh, objects. Um, so it, it turns out that if you uh, compute the uh, continuous cohomology, what you can show is that H1 of R mod ZR and H2. Z are both zero. And so if this short exact sequence gave rise to a long exact sequence of chronology groups, uh, what would you need? Uh, you would also need that uh, H1 R mod Z R mod Z to be zero, uh, but it's not. Okay, and there are a bunch of other examples that you can, you can write down where uh, the sort of classical categories are not well behaved. Uh, for instance, Bonnock spaces or topological vector spaces, right? Uh, and so these are all sort of uh, defects that the condensed setting is supposed to rectify. Okay, so how does it do this? Uh, the basic idea is to sort of uh, replace these classical categories with uh, richer categories that have sort of more objects in them to fill in the holes, right? So in this first basic example, we were missing a non-trivial co-kernel of this map. And so we're going to move to a more uh, richer category where there actually does exist such an object. Uh, so how do we actually do it? Okay, so I'm going to write a definition and this definition is going to have a bunch of jargon in it. Uh, and then I'll write down what it actually means concretely. So uh, in general, for any sort of uh, classical category, we can consider the condensed version of that category. So uh, a condensed set or group or ring, etc., is a sheaf of sets, groups, Rings on uh, this site. This is the Pro ATEL site of a plant. Okay, so this is a sort of uh, uh, dense, maybe overly opaque uh, definition. Uh, let me explain what this actually means in practice. So, first of all, uh, what is the pro etale site for point? Uh, so this is the category. So a site, right, is a category together with the growth and topology, which is a notion of cover of, of the objects. So this is the category of uh, profinite sets. Uh, there are a couple ways to say what profinite sets are. Um, so these are topological spaces. Uh, one characterization of profinite sets is that they can be expressed as inverse limits of inverse systems of finite uh, discrete spaces. Uh, another equivalent uh, definition is these are precisely the compact Alstor. Uh, totally disconnected spaces. Uh, 
Okay, so you can think of them as, as just being totally disconnected uh, compact elsewhere spaces. Uh, all right, and what is the notion of a cover here that we're going to use? A cover is uh, finite jointly surjective maps. So uh, with Okay, so if we have a profinite set S, then uh, a cover of S is going to be a uh, collection of finitely many maps, say some S0, some Sn, uh, such that the union of the images covers S. Okay. So then with this definition, what, what concretely is, say, a condensed set or a condensed group? So it's a, it's a sheaf uh, of these objects, meaning it's a contravariant functor uh, from this category to the appropriate category, uh, satisfying the sheaf condition. And the sheaf condition is, is somewhat simple here because our covers are, are all finite. So what is it really? Uh, condensed set or group, et cetera, is a functor. We'll call our condensed objects T for general. Uh, so it's a contravariant functor uh, from profinite sets to uh, the appropriate category sets or groups, et cetera. Okay, so this would just be a, a pre sheaf. Uh, the sheaf conditions in this case are basically the following. Uh, first, just so things are non trivial, uh, the empty space should be sent to uh, point the one element set of the trivial group, or whatever the sort of one element object is. Okay, uh, but more non trivially, um, If you have two profinite sets, S1 and S2, and you look at what T does to their disjoint union, uh, this should be the product. Okay. So in general, the categories we're mapping into are going to be categories that are nicely behaved, abelian, uh, so categories in which we have products defined at least, and a lot more. Okay, uh, and then there's another slightly technical definition and I'm going to write down, but I'm not going to say much about. Uh, one reason is if you restrict to a smaller but still large enough class of profinite sets, it's just automatically satisfied. Um, but let me write it down anyway. So if you have a surjection from one profinite set S prime, to another S, and you take the fiber product along this projection. Uh, we have projection maps I1, I2. From this fiber product to S prime. Then the natural map from TS to the set of X in TS prime to the pi one star. By pi one star, I mean. Uh, the, the map that pi one is sent to under this functor T. So because this is a 
contravariant functor, pi one star and pi two star are going to be maps from uh, S prime to this fiber product. Yeah, let me ask. That looks right, I think. Okay. Uh, this should be a, a bijection. Uh, so in particular, it should be um, onto this, this function. Uh, in other words, I write this in a way that sort of uh, looks more like the traditional sheaf condition. Uh, this map that we um, get from applying the functor to uh, the surjection uh, is the equalizer of pi one star and pi two star. Okay. Okay. Pretty good. Um, okay. Uh, one more little little bit of notation. Uh, a particular profinite set that we're going to care about, and maybe the simplest of them, is just the one point set. And so, if we look at what T does to star, which star will always just mean the one point. Uh, set for us. Uh, this is going to be called uh, the underlying set. If we're in infinite set or, or underlying group, et cetera. Uh, of T. Okay. Uh, so one, one remark just off the top. Um, this definition has some set theoretic issues, right? Uh, because uh, the collection of profinite sets is a proper class. It's too large to be a set. Uh, and so uh, it's not really good to have as our objects uh, functors defined on a proper class of objects. Um, there are ways around this. I, I don't want to spend too much time on them. They're not particularly interesting, uh, but they're necessary to ground the, the theory well. Um, what you essentially can end up doing and the, what the sort of people, I should say, uh, this is all work of, of Klaus and Schultzer. Uh, what the way they decided to get around this um, set theory difficulty is uh, for any strong limit cardinal kappa, uh, you can consider the restricted class of kappa condensed sets or kappa condensed groups, which are defined in the same way but only taking into account profinite sets of cardinality less than kappa. Okay, so I'll write this down. So uh, if kappa is a strong limit cardinal, uh, what this means is that um, if the cardinality of a set X is less than kappa, then the cardinality of the power set of X is less than kappa, that's what strong limit means. There are undoubtedly many strong limit cardinals. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is the power side of it. Yeah, the collection of all subsets of X, yeah. Uh, so there are cofinally many of these strong limit cardinals. Uh, uh, so if kappa is strong limit, then we define kappa condensed set in the same way, using only profinite sets of size less than kappa. Okay. Um, now we have a, uh, if kappa is less than kappa prime, then there is a, the forgetful functor from kappa prime condensed sets to kappa condensed sets. 
and this has a left adjoint. So you get uh, this left adjoint is fully faithful. Uh, so we get a fully faithful functor from Kappa condensed sets or groups or whatever uh, you're mapping into to Kappa prime. And then sets, and then you can define the large category, the full category of condensed sets as being the uh, direct limit uh, as Kappa ranges over all, all strong limit cardinals. So uh, the category of condensed sets is then, yes. Yes, but in setting clauses and showing the inner, not need to consider uh, how to say such a uh, problem. No, they do. They do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not really like in practice, you don't need to worry about it, but when you're setting up the theory, you need to do something like this. Yeah, so this is in the first part of their lecture notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Direct limit uh, along all strong limit. Okay, but in, in practice, you don't really need to worry about this, um, except for in a few places. We will not worry about it in this talk, at least. Okay, uh, very good. So I guess I should probably not use this board, right? Okay. Very good. Uh, all right. So remember, part of the motivation for this whole story uh, was that we wanted to work in these sort of classical uh, categories of topological objects. And so what you really want to be the case is that uh, these condensed settings really are sort of enlargements of those classical categories. And so what I want to talk about now is how to embed these classical objects into uh, the condensed setting. So say embedding. Let's say top into con. So top the category of topological spaces and con the category of condensed sets. Uh, okay, so what you do it is, is very simple and I think will help to motivate in retrospect the definition of condensed set. So given a topological space X. We can form a condensed set uh, X bar uh, as follows. So we need to define the value of X bar on every profinite set X. Uh, and we just define it to be the continuous maps uh, from S into X. Okay. Uh, and then there's an obvious way to extend this to be a, a functor to, to um, maps between topological spaces. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, first of all, why does this satisfy the, the requirements? Um, so, first of all, it's relatively routine to check that this is a contravariant functor. Uh, one and two are, are very simple. Uh, why does this satisfy three? Um, well, it satisfies three for the following reason. Um, let's say that we're in this setting. Uh, so we have S prime and S are profinite sets, and we have a surjection. Uh, in particular, S prime and S are uh, compact house door spaces. 
And so because this is a surjection, and when I write surjection here, I mean surjection in the appropriate category, so a continuous surjection, uh, it's a quotient map, right? Uh, so. Uh, and what does this mean? This means precisely that if a composite map into X is continuous, uh, then G is already continuous. And if you sort of unravel the definitions here, this right-hand side is going to be precisely the uh, continuous composite maps, and this left-hand side is going to be, by definition, precisely continuous maps. So this is saying that we really do have a, a surjection here. Okay, well, the other conditions are, are relatively straightforward to check, and, and therefore I, I will not check them. Um, one thing to note, and again, this is, so I'm not going to check, but we'll just assert. Um, if X happens to also be, say, a topological abelian group or a topological ring or vector space or whatever, uh, then uh, this condensed object is also a condensed group or ring or, or vector space. Topological group. Ring, et cetera then X bar is a condensed group ring, et cetera. Okay, very good. Uh, so let's, with, with this uh, in mind now, let's go back to our very simple original motivating example of this sort of pathological map from the reals with the discrete topology to the reals with the metric topology. So probably had this map. Okay, and we saw that in the category of topological abelian groups, this is not an isomorphism, but it does not have a non-trivial kernel, and there's not really a way to describe a non-trivial kernel. Uh, but now let's consider this map in now the category of condensed groups. Okay, so um, let me sort of rewrite this in a way more amenable to our notation. Okay, so we have this map now of condensed abelian groups. Uh, and this now has a non-trivial co-kernel. Uh, its kernel is still the, the trivial object, the zero object. Uh, but it has a non-trivial co-kernel that I'll call Q. And what is Q? Well, first, let's look at what these objects are as condensed abelian groups. Uh, so first, this one, which is the simplest. Uh, this as a condensed abelian group, when you apply it to some profinite set S, this is precisely just the continuous maps from S to R, where R is the usual Euclidean topology. Okay, about this. These are, okay. They're continuous maps from 
S to R with the discrete topology. But sort of more familiarly, these are precisely the locally constant maps from S to R. Uh, and so now we can say precisely what Q will be. Q on a profinite set S should be precisely uh, the continuous maps from S to R mod the locally constant maps from S to R. Okay, now note that uh, if S is finite, uh, then okay, a uh, continuous map and a locally constant map are the same, right? All, all maps are uh, continuous locally constant if S is finite. So if S is finite, then this quotient is going to be trivial, right? So in particular, for the one element set, uh, this is going to be the zero object. The trivial, you know, one element object, right? And this sort of corresponds to the fact that in the classical setting, this map does not have a non-trivial coterminal, right? The underlying set of Q is is trivial. Uh, however, uh, if S is infinite, then uh, Q of S is all of a sudden not non-zero, right? Uh, if S is infinite, then in general, Q of S is not going to be zero. Uh, for instance, you know, a very nice simple profinite set uh, S might be the convergent sequence. So a convergent sequence and its limit point. So if S is the convergent sequence, then Q of S is going to be what? Uh, it's going to be the convergent sequences. In R modulo uh, the eventually constant sequences in R. So we did all sorts of non trivial behavior uh, as soon as uh, S becomes infinite. So I haven't told two thirty. Is that right? Yes, in still have fifteen minutes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I said at the at the start of this talk that um, the motivation for this is that uh, these classical categories are not well behaved, and these condensed categories are are well behaved. Uh, let me make more precise what I mean by that. And what I mean by that essentially is that these condensed categories uh, are going to be abelian categories. So uh, I'm not gonna write down a precise definition. I'll write down uh, enough to give a sort of flavor. Um, but what you should think of abelian categories as, as they are categories that behave like a category of abelian groups uh, from an algebraic point of view. And these categories, uh, say, condensed abelian groups, uh, will behave exactly as nicely as the classical category of abelian groups. Uh, but they'll also be able. Yes. Yes, exactly. But um, strong limit means that. Still, even though you're increasing in cardinality, you're still below the, the size of kappa. So that's the only less than this time. It'll still be less than, yeah, strictly less than. Because that's, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I already avoid the problem. Right. What was I saying? I was saying that. Um, I can call a part. The category of uh, condensed abelian groups is a very nice category. In fact, it's an abelian category. 
are. This is the category of condensed abelian groups. Uh, so again, I don't want to write the, the full definition, uh, but let me say basically what an abelian category means. Uh, it means, okay, it has a zero object. Um, it's an additive category, so the, uh, the HOM sets have a abelian group structure. Uh, that sort of interacts well, you know, with each other and as a, as a category. Um, has all, you know, products. Uh, importantly, and this was the problem with topological abelian groups we saw, uh, it has all kernels and co-kernels. Um, in the category, monomorphisms and epimorphisms behave as you would like. They're normal. What does this mean? Uh, this means that every monomorphism is the kernel of some map and every epimorphism is the co-kernel of some map. Um, and so this is what it means to be an abelian category, more or less. There are some additional things that I can make this more precise. Uh, but not even that, that condensed abelian groups are, are a very nice abelian category. Um, they have, and this is sort of rare in the sunny night, uh, all limits and co-limits exist. Um, all products, uh, direct sums. Uh, And filtered pro limits. Are exact. Um, and and more. Okay. So what I want to turn to now, and this is where uh, some of the set theory work I did has some applications, is in looking at sort of how nice these embeddings of these topological categories into the condensed versions are. And so I want to start with a, a very nice and large class of objects on which the, uh, this embedding is as nice as you could want. Uh, and to Talking about this, I, I need to recall a definition. So if we have a, a topological space X, we say that it is compactly generated. Okay, it should be fine now. No, no, that's that's uh, that's different. That's not me. Yes. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. Uh, so called in a space is compactly generated if, so roughly speaking, this means that the topology of X is determined by the restriction to compact sub subspaces of X. Uh, formally, you might say this as follows. Um, so X is compactly generated if uh, for all maps. Uh, from X to some other space Y. In order to determine whether F is continuous, it's enough to look at uh, its composition with maps from compact spaces to X. So F is continuous if and only if every composition where K is compact. Uh, is continuous. Okay. 
so these are nice spaces, and this is a very large class of spaces. Most spaces that uh, most algebraic topologists want to study uh, satisfy this, right? So, for instance, all locally compact spaces, all first countable spaces, so all metric spaces, um, all CW complexes, uh, they're all, all compactly generated. Uh, and now if we go back to this embedding of top into con, uh, and it turns out that uh, if you restrict to the class of compactly generated spaces. It's this, it's this, yeah, this is the definition. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's probably equivalent to saying that a uh, subspace of X is closed if and only if its intersection with every compact uh, subspace is closed. Um, but yeah, this is this is the definition. Um, and, and if we if we take this embedding of topological spaces into transcendental groups, and we restrict it to the class of compactly generated topological spaces, uh, then we end up with a fully faithful embedding. So. Embedding of uh, say top into con uh, restricted to the class of compactly generated spaces uh, is fully faithful. Uh, and this remains true if you go to the sort of richer structures uh, like uh, condensed abelian groups, right? If you look at this embedding of topological abelian groups and condensed abelian groups and restrict to the compactly generated topological abelian groups, then the embedding is, is fully faithful. Uh, and so a, a natural question here is, well, okay, even though most of the spaces we care about, uh, or maybe not me, it's not theorists, but, but other mathematicians would care about uh, lie in this class, uh, you might still be interested in uh, how far you can extend this, right? Are there larger classes on which uh, this embedding is, is fully faithful? Um, and a particularly natural class that uh, Klaus and Schultz were wondering about and that led us to get interested in this in the first place uh, is the uh, category of, of pro abelian groups. Uh, so the question is the following, is the embedding of pro ab pro abelian groups into condensed abelian groups uh, fully faithful? Okay, so what is what is pro ab? Uh, one way to think about pro abelian groups is that uh, these are topological abelian groups that can be uh, represented as inverse limits of inverse systems of abelian groups, where each of those abelian groups has just the discrete topology. Okay, so this is a question that they were interested in and that led them to get in touch with us after we did some of our work. So I want to end with sort of explaining how some work in set theory can shine some light on this question. Very good. All right, so I want to look at a, a particularly simple 
example of a probial group and one that will play uh, a big role in, in our story here. So a typical, maybe typical is not the right word, but a, a simple example of a probial group. Uh, is going to be the product over some index set i of powers of c. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, here I have i and j are some uh, non-empty index sets. This is the product, full support product of j many copies of z as an abelian group with the discrete topology. And I've written the product in quotation marks to mean this product is taken in the category of probabilian groups. Okay, uh, so this is a typical and quite simple example of a probabilian group. Uh, and now you want to ask, okay, when we embed even just these groups uh, into transnestabilian groups in the obvious way, uh, is this embedding fully faithful? Uh, and this ends up being an interesting question. So if This is fully faithful. Then in particular, we would need that if we look at the HOM set probability groups of this product with let's say Z, we would need this to be equal or you know, corresponds isomorphically um, to the HOM set in condensed abelian groups. Now these considered as condensed abelian groups. Okay, uh, now, this statement, as I've written it, ends up being true, uh, at least if I is countable, and probably in general. Uh, so this is true. At least if I is countable. Okay. Uh, however, um, what, what Klausen and Schultz have, have told us, what is being the case, is that for various reasons, uh, when working in advanced mathematics, you really want to be working at the level of de derived categories. And so uh, if you want to ask whether this embedding is fully faithful at the level of the derived categories, then you really also need to be asking if the higher uh, X functors are equal as well. Okay. So the level of the derived categories. Okay. Uh, really, at a little drive categories, you want to ask if the R home functors are the same, but um, let's just think about the, the possible X functors. Uh, so we also want the higher X functors. Be equal. Okay. Uh, now, on the probelian side, all of these higher X functors are zero. So, okay. okay. Uh, what about in the condensed abelian predatory side? Um, so, uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to go through the calculation, um, in part because I don't uh, entirely understand all the steps myself, but I've been assured it is correct. But what you end up with is the following. So xn on ab of but, but you can compute this as uh, a derived functor of the inverse limit functor of a appropriate uh, inverse limit of abelian groups. Uh, this is going to be the nth derived functor of the inverse limit functor. Uh, 
the direct sum over i, or let's say over little i and i, the direct sum of j i of z, where what does this limit range over? This limit ranges over all families j i or j or i and i of finite subsets of j. So for each i and i, you choose a finite subset j i of j. You get this direct sum. Uh, there's a natural ordering on these choices of j i's. Uh, just you look at the uh, coordinate wise subset relation. Uh, this is a directed order. You can take the direct the uh, inverse limit on this and uh, compute the higher derived uh, functors of the inverse limit functor. Okay, so you end up with this object, and it turns out that this object is something that we can talk about in set theory. So, let's see how much time I have left. Okay, okay so. Some notation. Uh, first of all, so I don't have to write this over and over. Um, I'm going to express this inverse limit. I'm going to call it a i j. Okay, so let lambda i j. Note the collection of all functions. F from I to the set of finite subsets of J. So these are precisely the sort of things that we're taking the limit over in this uh, inverse limit. Now, given uh, an F. In this lambda ij, let d of f be defined as a set of pairs ij so that i is an i and uh, j is an f of i. Think of this as sort of the region below the graph of f in a certain sense. And what we're going to be interested in studying. Are families of functions. So a family of functions by uh, indexed by elements of lambda ij. These are going to be functions from, so phi f will be a function from i of f to z. We have one of these for every function f lambda ij. I want to say that such a family is coherent if any pair of these functions agree with one another mod finite. Okay, so this is uh, shorthand it's for all f and g. Uh, equal star means agree mod finite. And when I write this, I mean when both functions are restricted to their common domains. So on their common domains, they have at most finitely many disagreements. Now, there's an easy way to construct a coherent family of functions. Uh, just take a single function from all of i cross j to z, and let each of these phi f's be the restriction of that function to i of f, and then maybe change finitely many values if you want. Uh, so we call a family that is defined in that way trivial. So trivial, if there exists a function psi from all of i cross j to z, such that psi is equal mod finite to phi f for all f. Okay. So now these families are fun uh, functions look like things that set theorists might study, and indeed they have. Uh, and the natural question with this definition is 
Okay, uh, we saw that you know these trivial families are sort of the easy ones to define. Uh, are there any others? So, are there any non-trivial coherent families of functions? So that's one question. And then another, another question is, how is this relevant to the story of the intelligence? And I'll answer both of those here at the end. Okay. So uh, the answer to the second question is the following. Um, at least at the level of n equals one, asking whether this limit is zero or not is the same as asking whether there are any uh, coherent non-trivial families. So lim one a i j is zero, which is what we want for the embedding to be fully faithful. If and only if every coherent family of this form is trivial. Okay, so the most basic case here is where i and j are both countable sets, say the natural numbers. Uh, in this case, this is actually an object that was uh, studied in the 80s and 90s by set theorists. So, uh, fact, um, if the continuum hypothesis holds, so if the cardinality of the reals is the smallest uncountable cardinality, then lim one of A, say N, N, uh, is non zero. The continuum hypothesis. Okay. Uh, there's another uh, axiom of set theory uh, that sort of goes beyond the ZFC axioms but can be added to it called the proper forcing axiom. Uh, and this gives the opposite answer. So this actually implies that lim one a and n is zero. Okay, so the question of whether this limit is zero is independent of the usual axioms of set theory. Um, this is just the, the first uh, derived limit though. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the work that I did recently, which was joint with uh, Jeff Bergfock, uh, is that uh, it is consistent. So from the proper forcing axiom, you only get the first derived limit being zero. In fact, if this axiom holds, then the second derived limit is provably not zero. Uh, so it's not known until very recently if you could consistently get all these limits to be non-zero which is what you would want for this embedding to be fully faithful. And we prove that it is in fact consistent with CFC uh, that uh, lim n a and n is zero for all n simultaneously. Okay. Uh, so in particular, if you restrict to just the sort of countably indexed uh, probabilian groups, and this embedding will be fully faithful in this model. So this raised the hope that maybe consistently this embedding is just fully faithful everywhere. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, we prove this is not the case. Uh, basically, as soon as you move beyond this basic case, uh, you run into provably non-zero limits. So if this J is uncountable uh, and an i is infinite. Uh, then lim one of a i j is not zero. So this embedding is not going to be fully faithful. 
uh, even applied just to say the product of totally many copies of uh, Z to the positive one. Okay. Um, and let me just close with one with one final thing. Um, so uh, essentially what this, what this is showing is that uh, in the condensed setting, these X groups can be richer than they are in the classical settings. And there's a sort of, uh, uh, I think, amusing uh, theorem you can prove. There's a famous question uh, from the 1950s in homological algebra called the Whitehead problem. Uh, and it's in the context of abelian groups. And it asks, let's say you have an abelian group A. Uh, is it the case that if you know that uh, X1 of AZ is zero, uh, does this imply that A is free? The converse is, is true. It's pretty easy to prove. Free groups have this uh, X vanishing. Uh, this was asked in the 50s, and it was famously resolved by uh, Shala, 73, and he proved, uh, surprisingly, that this is independent of the axioms of set theory. So, uh, if, uh, say, B equals the constructible universe L, uh, then, uh, yes, if an axiom called Martin's axiom it doesn't matter what these are. These are both axioms that are consistent with the axioms of set theory. Then no. Uh, and so this was sort of thought to be the end of the question for a while, it sort of killed the question off. Uh, but it turns out that if you ask this question uh, in the world of condensed alien groups, then it has an answer. So I'll end with this theorem. This is probably due to Clausen and Schultze. And it says the following, uh, if A is an abelian group, just a classical abelian group, and you compute the internal X of A and Z in the category of condensed abelian groups, uh, and you get zero, so here, A and Z are both given the discrete topology. Uh, then A is free. So essentially, uh, this fact that we saw over here that in the condensed world, these X groups can be richer than they are in the classical setting means that even if you're in this setting uh, where classically you have groups A that have trivial X groups that are non-free, in the in the condensed setting, there will be not like these X groups will become non-zero. Uh, the... Yeah, this is in the condensed setting, this is a theorem of ZFC. It does not depend on the axioms of set theory. So in a certain sense, if you look at it in a certain way, uh, Whitehead's problem is has an answer in the condensed setting. And so this might raise the possibility that other sort of classical problems that have proven to be independent. Uh, of set theory, if reinterpreted in the condensed world, might have provable answers in ZFC. Um, I don't know of any other examples than this one, but uh, it's uh, intriguing at least. Okay, so I think that's all I yeah. wanted to say. So, so thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, please find your yeah, I don't know exactly. So the theorem of Clausen and Schultz's uh, recent theorem? Yeah, I mean, it even, uh, it's not even something they were sort of trying to prove, it just sort of fell out of what they're doing. So it's like, they were not aiming at this theorem or anything, they just, we're trying to, you know, compute X and compute homologies in the in setting and, and, and found this. Um, I don't actually know of a proof written up anywhere. They sort of sketch the proof and they have, there's a, a series of YouTube videos that if you're interested in this more, uh, you should watch. 
uh, they gave a like 20 session masterclass on this and the videos are all on YouTube and the proof is sketched there. But I don't know if it's written up anywhere. Hmm? On condensed mathematics, um, given maybe two years ago. Mathematics is, is their invention or, or who, who came up with? Yes, it's Klausen and Schultz. Uh, there's another pair of mathematicians, uh, Barwick and Hain, uh, who have a sort of a very similar um, setting that called Pyknotic uh, sets. Um, but uh, are basically doing this similar things from a different perspective um, around the same time. But yeah, so far, basically all the foundational work is due to Klausen and Schultz. So what do you expect that the inside of the new talent in homology and the... Oh, I don't know. I'm not nearly enough of an expert. But I, I think at least uh, some of their motivation was aimed not at problems in sort of traditional homological algebra, but more applying these algebraic tools to settings where they were not applicable before, in particular, uh, say, functional analysis, right? To, to apply these tools to settings where the real numbers play a big role. So. And those are the sort of theorems that they're that they're aiming at. 